Welcome to everyone. Welcome to the speakers, to all the participants of this series of webinars on reductionism in risk assessment held by ENSER, the European Network of Scientists for, for Social and Environmental Responsibility. Welcome to those in the Zoom session as well as those in the live stream. You can participate in two ways. Well, you can participate a bit less in the live stream, but you still can. My name is Diederik Sparnos. I'm the scientific coordinator of ENSER and the moderator of these webinars. Um, what are we going to talk about? What are we going to discuss with you? We have a fairly good legislation in the European Union on things like genetically modified organisms, on pesticides, on chemicals, etc. Um, if you look at the text of the legislation, it's not that bad. It seems to protect us quite well, and the EU actually promises a high level of protection. And it seems to offer this if you look at the text. Yet, the practice is different. The practice is very permissive. Um, we get, for instance, a lot of GMOs, genetically modified organisms, um, authorized for import in our food and in our food and feed, and a lot of them are actually used in animal feed in Europe. And with pesticides and chemicals, there's also a lot of criticism from environmentalists, from citizens and from scientists alike. Are our health and our environment properly protected. Many people doubt it. How come this difference between the law and the practice, the seeming difference between the law and the practice, this all revolves around the way in which science is being used in Europe to make policy. Four ENSA members, four of our scientists, have written a scientific paper about this, a peer-reviewed paper in the scientific journal Environmental Sciences Europe, in which they focused on the case of GMOs, genetically modified organisms. And this paper has led to setting up these three webinars. But the webinars will expand the view to include pesticides and other chemicals. So we will not just speak about GMOs. Um, in fact, they will only come into view in the second webinar properly. The webinars will be held on three consecutive Thursday afternoons from five, four, sorry, from four to five thirty p.m. every time, Central European Summer Time. And the three of the four authors of the paper will be among the speakers, plus an additional pesticide expert. The first of these webinars will take a look at how the European Union has interpreted the role of science in policy making for public health and environmental health and how this interpretation has developed over time. This will be done for policy in general but also for pesticides in particular. The second webinar next week, September 24th, will then focus on GMOs, genetically modified organisms, and if you produce criticism on things like this, you should also be able to say how it can be done better, to show a better way to use science in policy making. And this is what we do in the third webinar. How can we find a practice that really protects public health and the environment? Our intention with these webinars is to get into a discussion with you, with the participants, with the audience. So you're kindly invited to comment, to ask questions and to make comments either in speaking or in writing. And all three authors that are speakers and um, the instigators of the webinar series, they will all be present at each of the three webinars and will be ready and happy to join the conversation, even if they have not actually held a lecture on that day. To participate in, to participate by saying something, raise your hand digitally. Um, 
You can do that by going to your own name in the participant lists. Press the participants button at the bottom, go to the participant list and you'll be able to uh, click on a button which will raise your hand digitally. We will get a list of the raised hands and I will um, allow you to, uh, to say something in the discussion after the talk. To participate in writing, write your question in the Q&A box. There's also a Q&A icon at the bottom of your Zoom window or write it in the live stream. In the live stream, there's also an option for putting in written questions. If you're in the live stream, you cannot participate by speaking. Um, in both cases, if you, whether you speak or whether you write something, please state your name and affiliation, just like in a physical conference. Uh, and if you want us to see you, which would be nice, please turn on your webcam. It may be that my colleague Lucas Rowe, who does all the technology for these webinars, will also have to switch on your webcam. He will do so if that's necessary so we can see you. Now these webinars are not only live streamed but also recorded and they will be published online by answer afterwards. So we need to think about your privacy. If you read the registration text carefully, then you will have seen the remark that by registering for the webinar, you have given us your permission to publish and live stream your video image and your spoken remarks. So that should not be a problem. If you're putting in a written comment, we shall not mention your name and affiliation, but we do want to see them just like from everyone who makes a comment. We shall ignore anonymous comments. So if you write a question in the Q&A box, please add your name and affiliation. Your name may already be there in the Zoom, but not in the live stream. Um, but we shall not name it to preserve your privacy. I think that's all I needed to say. Um, and I'd like to hand over to our two speakers of today. And that is Professor Eric Milstone of the University of Sussex in the UK and Dr. Angeliki Lissimachu of the Pesticide Action Network in Brussels. I believe Eric Milstone will start. Am I right, Eric? Over to you. The screen is yours, not the floor, but the screen. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. And many thanks uh, to all, all, all participants, whether uh, on Zoom or, or, or live streamed. I will be making a PowerPoint presentation and I hope you can now see uh, my, my slides. Um, okay, so I have 44 slides and I don't want to take up more than half of the session, so there's plenty of time to speak. So I will um, perhaps speak quickly, I hope not too quickly for you to follow what I'm saying. Um, the, what I put up here on the screen are some of the questions that we'll be looking at today. Um, how do we understand the role of science and of, of politics and expertise in um, systems of governance? Uh, we will be talking about several concrete examples, but I also want to offer a general way of of our understanding these relationships. What is the what are the roles of science and of politics? Can these tasks be separated? If so, what should be the division of labor amongst them? And typically, in relation to these kinds of topics, um, the role of science is often portrayed as assessing risks. Um, however, it's entirely reasonable to ask, should the benefits in exchange for which for which risks might be deemed acceptable should benefits and alternative ways of addressing those benefits also be assessed uh, and so we'll try to understand how science and politics are interacting but also what are the consequences of the ways they're interacting and the ways they're failing to interact are they in practice keeping the, the public safe um, 
So first I want to review uh, sort of chronological evolution of ideas about uh, the role of scientific advisors in public policy making. And those ideas have not simply been sort of theoretical, but they've also been influencing the design, structure and operation of policy making institutions. And that's something I will also discuss. So, and then we'll look at the consequences. Okay, so let me go back to the late 19th century. When is this issue started to be addressed systematically? I think prior to that time, the narrative was simply, you know, the monarch, the ruler, is somehow possessed of wisdom and, and they make choices. But things started to change once we had industrialized society. And in the 19th century, clearly, the world in which people were adults was very different from the world into which they'd been born. And therefore, the rate of change was so obvious with industrialization of, of economies and, and countries. And so the question that was first articulated explored by Weber and Durkheim in terms of what is the role of public officials and civil servants in relation to um, government ministers and rulers. And the model they developed was essentially policymakers choose what it is the administration is intending to achieve um, and then it, the responsibility is handed over to official and advisors to figure out what is the, the best way of achieving the ends. Now, in these models that I'm using, um, ignoring from, if you will, the dark blue background, but looking just at the colours in the foreground, I am using red to indicate the, the warmth and maybe even the heat of politics, while I'm using a pale blue to convey what I might think of as the cool or cold quality of science. So on this model, values came first and facts came second. Um, so there was a division of labour, policymakers decided what you were trying to achieve and then officials tried to accomplish it. But that, that model is problematic and that was pointed out by um, technocrats and positivists who said, hang on, and let's go back to the model for a minute, policy makers can't always choose what ends to pursue without first getting advice, especially from scientific experts. I mean, an obvious example is climate change. Um, thankfully, many government ministers, many governments around the world are concerned about climate change. Sadly, not all, but that the level of concern is a consequence of the fact that scientists first came to identify, acknowledge the problem of, um, of climate change as a consequence of human activity. And it's only because they've done so that the issue rises onto the agenda of policymakers. And in response to that, they, you know, looking at that model, this model, they say, well, that can't be right because the science comes before the policy. So, uh, in fact, what they offered was a very different model of science, which I call, and I think appropriately, a technocratic model, which is essentially scientists have the facts on the basis of those facts. They know what needs to be done and how it can be accomplished. They therefore tell policymakers what to do. And that became, this model became an official orthodoxy in most industrialized countries in the period after the Second World War. And this was reflected in the structure of institutions. Governments would set up expert advisory committees of scientists and policy decisions would emerge from those expert committees. And, um, the, and then ministers would claim that they are just doing what and only what their experts tell them. Uh, and Th that, this kind of narrative, this kind of model can be very attractive to both policy makers and experts. Government ministers and commissioners at the European Commission enjoy being able to shelter behind scientific experts. They like to say, we are following the science or we are doing what and any what our expert advisors tell, tell us to do. But I maintain, and I, 
I will seek to demonstrate that that is always a misleading narrative. It never works like that. Um, I mean, one of the obvious reasons why it doesn't work like that is actually scientific evidence is typically incomplete, equivocal, and uncertain on vital science-based policy issues. It's often very difficult to know how uncertain the science is, but I picked out one particular example where members of the scientific community went to extreme lengths to seek to estimate the magnitude of the uncertainty. And this relates to the artificial sweetener saccharin. Saccharin was introduced into the food supply of the US initially and then in, 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 sorry, in Europe in the late 19th century. And within a few years, heated debates rose about its safety and those debates have continued ever since but they got particularly heated in the 1970s when some very well conducted studies showed that when saccharin was fed to rats especially over two generations there was statistically significant dose related increase in bladder cancer in male rats and this provoked a lot of concern there were debates about whether saccharin should be banned um, but then there's an argument, well, that's rats, but are rats a good model for people? So they looked not only at uh, rats, but also mice and guinea pigs, and they also did tests not on live animals, but also on bacteria in, in tissue culture dishes. And they also did human epidemiological studies because, for example, the people most likely to use saccharin, the main artificial sweetener, were diabetics. And you could examine the population of diabetics and see where they had a higher incidence of cancer, or in particular bladder cancer in men. Um, and you can also look at people, men with bladder cancer, and see whether they were more likely than other members of the, the population to um, have eusaccharin. And there were studies, many studies in all of those three areas, and the US National Research Council tried to estimate the upper and lower limits of the of, 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 of estimates of risk from saccharin and they came to the conclusion in 1978 that if the if on average the u.s citizens kept consuming saccharin at rate that they were then consuming it the extra cases of cancer might be as few as 0.22 cases. that's in, in, per, a lifetime risk which corresponds to something like one case of cancer every few hundred years to as many as 1,144,000 extra cases in the lifetime. So that is massive uncertainty. <laughs> now, we don't know how typical and representative it is, and this is unusual that they've quantified the uncertainty, but what they showed was that all the scientific evidence was insufficient to determine a, as well, a point reliable point estimate of what the risk from saccharin might be, in which case the, the suggestion that science can decide policy just becomes totally implausible. And while ex experts and, civil, and, and, and officials often talk about, well, if there's uncertainty, we can do a bit more science and, and that will resolve it. No, <laughs> uncertainties and disagreements are often not temporary, but chronic. And as we know from so many cases, whether it's climate change or GM crops or pesticides, the scientific community does not speak with one voice and there is no certainty. Um, and even if all the scientific uncertainties were eliminated, science still could not decide um, food and environmental safety policies because they're all about one of the possible risks are acceptable in exchange for possible benefits. And those are socially variable value judgments um, and not, not issues that science can settle. As um, English language speaking philosophers like to say, you cannot derive an ought from an is. So the, uh, the orthodox model in the post-war period was coming under repeated criticism was seemingly increasingly problematic so some new understanding was needed and one version which has been very influential which i think is now the contemporary orthodoxy emerged in 1983 in u.s government publication from the well national academy of sciences it was called risk assessment in the federal government and so 
So here it was published with a bright red cover and has come to be known as the Red Book model. And this is a graphic representation of it. It says, okay, so science comes first, scientists assess risks, but they do so in a politically neutral way, uninfluenced by political considerations, but they pass their judgment on to policymakers, risk managers as they're called, and they can take into account non-scientific considerations like, well, what's the trade-off between risk and benefits? Um, what does it cost to try to diminish risks? Um, what are the benefits of doing that? All kinds of values and interests and practicalities. So this is a bit like an inversion of the original Weber Durkheim model, which had politics first and science second. This is science first and politics second. Oh, and then there's the third section where having the scientists decided what the risks are um, and the policymakers deciding what to do about it, they then tell industry, consumers, whatever, what they should be doing. And of course, you need a bit of social science to know how, how to do that effectively. Um, now, two important aspects of this model is firstly, it keeps science separate from the politics and also <laughs> the arrows go in what they're unidirectional. So that the risk assessment influences risk management but politics is supposed not to influence risk assessment. And this is now the, the modern orthodoxy. And you see it embodied in institutional structures. So in our field, say, the European Food Safety Authority advise, as they are the risk assessors, and they send their advice to the European Commission with the Council of Ministers and they're the risk managers. And so Esther's line is, oh, we just do science, not policy. And um, the Commission's line is, oh, no, we do the policy, but we don't interfere with the science. Um, and we take what we get um, from, from, um, from the scientists and science and politics are kept in watertight containers, is the narrative. Um, and that is a step forward that wasn't you know better than the preceding model but it's still inadequate because while it acknowledges some uncertainties it's incomplete and it ignores in particular the way that as i put it here non-scientific considerations typically routinely but invariably frame scientific representation of risk what counts as a risk do you only look at um, biophysical risks, or do you also take into account socioeconomic risks? Uh, what is to be protected? And those are policy judgments, and they influence what the scientific risk assessors do, but unfortunately, for most of the time, they do it in a way without being willing explicitly to acknowledge that. And, um, and, and that, that's something that is profoundly problematic. Um, and we're arguing, yeah, that not only does the policy assumptions frame the science, but a particular set of policy assumptions have been framing um, science. And this is not uniquely true of Europe, it's also true in the USA and international organizations like the World Health Organization. But we're concentrating on the European example. We are FC, sorry, ENSA is after all a European organization. So typically what we're arguing is that risk assessors in European institutions are only looking at some of the risks, not all of them. And also that the way they select and interpret evidence is, has also been problematic. Um, often they are much more, they subject evidence of possible harm or risk to much more severe scrutiny and criticism than studies apparently um, showing or indicating the absence of risk. Um, and, and we're highly critical of that because we think that is not providing adequate protection for public and environmental health. And now the source of many of these uncertainty and th these framing assumptions um, 
of a risk assessment, where, yes, we're calling them non-scientific framing assumptions, but I'm also using a vocabulary that was introduced by the Joint World Health Organization, UN Food and Agriculture Organization, Codex Alimentarius Commission, which sets um, baseline standards for internationally traded agricultural and food products. They've introduced a concept of what they call risk assessment policy and we think that's the right term of it and we're going to use it and explain what we meant it. and um okay so in effect the, the um <laughs> codex back in when was it um 2003 and then all codex member states which includes all eu member states and the european commission all implicitly rejected that simple red book model in favor of what we call a, a co-dynamic, as other people call it, a co-evolutionary model. And it's not totally dissimilar from the Red Book model in that it does pose, um, <laughs> well, but it's a, it includes a scientific expert assessment, but that scientific expert assessment in the middle is, as it were, sandwiched between two sets of policy considerations an upstream one and a downstream one and these upstream assumptions considerations which call risk management framing assumption or risk assessment policy they influence and frame scientific expert assessments and now you'll see the arrows are reciprocal they both go they go both ways. So there's influence between the, the interpermeability between science and policy. Um, uh, so expert scientific risk assessments are, on this model, hybrid combinations of both scientific considerations and non-scientific policy considerations. And once scientific expert assessments of risk have been completed, they do pass them all back to policymakers, risk managers, where they make indeed trade-offs between risks and benefits and judgments of acceptability. And so I'm portraying the science as sandwiched between two different sets of policy considerations. And that's why they're in slight two, two different shades of red, because they're both political, but there's slight differences in what kinds of considerations arise. And I maintain that this is firstly a model which is implicit in text to which the European Union and all its member states and all other members of WHO and FAO have committed themselves to or at least adopted in principle. But it's also a more realistic representation of what actually happens in policy making and I'll use this model to try to illustrate how that works. But the Codex Elementaris came up with a, 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 an, an account of the role of risk assessment policy for risk assessors, and it says it in these terms. Determination of risk assessment policy should be included as a specific component no, it's not for scientists, it's for policymakers. And then risk assessment policy should be established by risk managers in advance of risk assessment. So it does come first, but it can be conducted in consultation with risk assessors. They might have something to contribute to those deliberations, but they shouldn't be making the decision. But it, then it says, and all other interested parties. And part of what we're arguing in this set of webinars is the, this just isn't happening. These institutions have committed themselves nominally to doing this, but there ha hardly any of them are doing it, and hardly any of them are doing it properly. Now, I maintain, and I don't have time to go into this in detail, but there are at least three main types of risk assessment policy judgments that are indispensable in practice in any scientific risk assessment. I call them substantive, procedural and interpretive. And by substantive, I mean, these are about judgments about what counts as a risk. And related to that, what counts as relevant evidence about a risk? Procedural assumptions, policy assumptions, about, in effect, how, the, how risk assessments should be conducted. Um, should they take place in close secret meetings or should they be 
transparent? Should they accept unpublished confidential data or should um, they only uh, look at um, evidence that's in the public domain? And of course, then how do you interpret the evidence that you, you look at? And they're, they're all very important. But in this set of webinars, we're particularly concentrating on substantive risk assessment policy judgments. And because they're, 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 they are, I maintain, central to the problem we're addressing of the narrowness of European risk assessments. You know, these judgments influence do the scientists assess just one possible risk or a few possible risks, or many, or all of them. And we will be arguing today and over the next couple of um, webinars that in practice, the European Food Safety Authority is confining its attention, well, often not just to one possible risk, but only a few, not many, and most certainly not all. And this is a fundamental flaw in the way EFSA's approached its risks and we're going to look at some examples yeah and we're going to say that they're adopting what we're calling and i think accurately um a reductionist approach they're adopting over simplistic assumptions that narrow down the scope of their judgment narrow down the range of evidence that that they, they accept and the the issues they look at and that this is this is not just scientifically inadequate, it's also politically very problematic and it's often incompatible with what the legislation says they should do and those approaches should be replaced by much more comprehensive ones. Okay, yes, and what's happening now, since we have, as it were, a model that the, uh, 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 is fundamentally sort of co-evolutionist, but it's being misrepresented in accordance with um, what I call the red book model. So in practice, what is happening is lots of important policy judgments are being decided not by policymakers, and not overtly by policymakers, but left to the scientists and their um, preconceptions which in many cases they're often not self-conscious they think you know they think well i'm a scientist so only factual statements can come out of my mouth so my, i'm entirely uninfluenced by politics and we're saying that's fundamentally flawed often scientists are being expected to or required to make policy judgments while have the masquerading as if they were science and they're often um, acquiescing in doing this and colluding with this uh, practice. Um, so, but, but not all risk assessment policies have been um, decided by scientists. Um, the, some risk assessment policy judgments are embodied in legislation. So, yeah, you, you will appreciate there have been uh, and continue to be conflicts between European Union and the USA over the acceptability of GM foods and the cultivation of GM crops. And this is partly because we have different legislation which requires experts to assess different things. In the USA, when they're assessing the environmental impact of cultivating GM crops, they only are concerned if they can find adverse effects on plants and animals which adversely affect the commercial interests of US farmers. Other changes consequent on cultivation and adaptations are not a problem at all, not risks that need to be controlled. Whereas even since 1990, when Directive 9220 was established, um, European risks were required to, and indeed did, assess adverse effects on at least, uh, some adverse effects on plants and animals flora and fauna irrespective of their commercial significance but following the rumpus in the late 90s particularly over food safety and mad cow disease um, and which, which provoked and contributed to a crisis about the acceptability of agricultural biotechnology european legislation was strengthened and the environmental will Lease Directive, established in 2001, known as 2001-18, said that in effect 
the scope of European risk assessments had been too narrow because they'd only looked at direct and short-term effects and they stipulated that henceforth European risk assessors should look at long-term effects and indirect effects and so the legislation says something about the scope of the assessment and in relation to pesticides uh, regulation 2009 said you know we, we need a high level of protection of human animal health and environment as well as safeguarding the competitiveness of European agriculture but it, it also recognizes that you can't just assess risk to average um, adults because populations are more complex and susceptible and so it calls for particular attention to the protection of vulnerable groups including pregnant women infants and children so opening and widening the scope of risk assessment thereby articulating and specifying stipulating some risk assessment policy and also said that the precautionary principle should be applied um, so, so um, and but again we'll be arguing that that has not been um, implemented <laughs> and again yes of um, this regulation said any um, active substance in um, pesticide products um, shouldn't be approved if it could cause cancer mutations or be harmful to reproduction or disrupt uh, human endocrine systems <laughs> but again we're going to be arguing that that's not being properly implemented and if it's a persistent organic pollutant or if it's persistent by accumulating and toxic it shouldn't be used when it, uh, but <laughs> these criteria are not being properly uh, applied as we be arguing yes um at this point perhaps um my colleague Angeliki would like to come in on behalf of pan europe pan is um pesticide action network Angeliki, would you like to uh pick up on yes. this quote from yourself um, yes, uh, I mean, you explained it very well. Um, uh, we are looking at the best said uh, regulation and how it's implemented. Uh, we found out that uh, very often academic studies on the effects of uh, the products, the best side products that contain the active ingredients. Um, they are dismissed from the evaluation, from the assessment. So, um, and they're not taken into consideration at all, even uh, afterwards in the overall, when they do what they call a uh, weight of evidence. So when they're looking at the overall evaluation of the active substance. And um, another thing we, um, that is, is happening is that the core formulas that they're adding into these uh, uh, pesticide products they are proprietary secrets and we don't know them and we don't have access to them. Um, so maybe next slide. I don't think I can change the slides myself. Yeah. Um, yes, so, um, yes, you can't um, assess risks of ingredients in a, in a mixture if you don't even know what those ingredients are. Um, and what we find, there's something very, very odd about the way in which pesticides are regulated in the European pesticide products. Um, what are called active ingredients, or the you know the main toxic ingredient in pesticide products, those are supposed to be assessed and regulated at a European-wide level, acting on the advice of, of, of the European Food Safety Authority. But they don't assess the risk of Form, commercial formulation and products that are actually sold and used around Europe, the approval of those um, is done by individual member states. And this is really problematic because, uh, as, as this paper, amongst others, has shown, actually the products ca can be and sometimes are more toxic than the single active ingredient but 
EFSA won't look at evidence from mixtures or um, a, a commercials. Oh no, we are, we're told only to look at the active ingredient. And so they discount important evidence. And so these are just a couple of recent papers showing that mixtures can be much more dangerous um, than the individual compounds. But, oh yeah, sorry. And Angelique, you'd like to come in again on this example? Yeah, because uh, just to give an illustration of what this means uh, in practice when EFSA does a risk assessment, here we have picked up an example um, of um, the World Health Organization and International Agency for Research on Cancer, uh, which is an independent body. Um, and they carried out um, the glyphosate, they carry out uh, carcinogenicity assessment in several chemicals and they also did it in glyphosate. Glyphosate is the active ingredient of um, the very known and widely used uh, herbicide Roundup. Um, so uh, what we found um, is what happened is that the um, IARC found that glyphosate is probable human carcinogen. This is uh, in Europe, it would be a class uh, 1A, so it will fall under the, uh, the cutoff criteria and it should be banned. Um, and where in, in our case, EFSA, which did the scientific independent risk assessment, found that it's not at all a human carcinogen, not even a class uh, category, a second class, like not identified at all. Um, now, when we look into what happened, we, we saw that, so uh, um, IARC, <coughs> uh, which uh, is, was a panel of uh, 17 independent scientists from 11 different countries, uh, they used only publicly available studies. Uh, that doesn't mean that they didn't use uh, industry studies that they were sponsored by the industry, but it means that they were using them only if they were uh, publicly available. So what they found is um, they found that there was limited evidence in humans uh, because of um, people that had been exposed uh, to glyphosate products and they had developed uh, non-Hawking lymphoma. Um, they found sufficient ed evidence in experimental animals from laboratories uh, that had developed uh, tumors and they had really strong uh, mechanistic evidence when it came to genotoxicity both from animal studies, but also from humans. Um, so we, we see the, yeah, but on the other hand, when we see the case of EFSA, that they use uh, uh, the European risk assessment, assessment system, and, and to look at why they decided that it's not a human carcinogen, uh, we saw that the, although they did identify some evidence in humans, they said that it was not enough, it was not, um, it wasn't covered, it was not backed up by the uh, mechanistic, uh, but the experimental data. But then when we look at the um, uh, experimental data from animals, we saw that they did find some, um, and some animals had developed tumors, but they found that it was not significant. Uh, they decided it was not significant. Uh, and then when looking at the mechanistic data, they did find also some, uh, mechanistic data, but they decided um, that this genotoxicity was not relevant because they had used uh, the products instead of the active ingredient. So it was, they were really narrowing down so much the, uh, the scope and they decided uh, at the end, they, they concluded that it's not a carcinogen. Um, of course, afterwards we also, it was, uh, it came out because of uh, all this, um, uh, court cases in the US that there was uh, some ghost written scientific papers that were used in these cases and all the, the um, of, and all the conclusions were based on the industry sponsored studies that at the moment we didn't even have access to them. Um, so this is how uh, the, the risk assessment system works in Europe at the moment. Eric, I think we can go to the next one. Yeah, great. And this is just a short uh, illustration. Uh, it was developed from a colleague from um, another NGO. 
uh, he was pre presented in some hearings that took place in the European Parliament in 2018 on this uh, investigating this issue on glyphosate um, and the whole uh, pesticide authorization system. So here you can see clearly um, it's an illustration of the studies used uh, by the industry by and the and EFSA uh, to conclude, and then with with the come the the studies that they have been sponsored by the industry, you have it here on your left. And the, you see that most of them, the, the sponsor studies, um, they have found that there was no damage. Um, so when they look at the genotoxicity, there was no evidence of genotoxicity. And then you have a very small part of, that were inconclusive. Now, if we look at the uh, studies that have been published in the academic, uh, we see that most of them, like you see now uh, three quarters, uh, they have found out that there is uh, DNA damage and this is because they looked at uh, not just one test but they did a variety of tests, so they opened um, the options and very only very small fraction they found out that there was no DNA damage and here you can see that how by selecting at the end uh, your studies you can um, you can have a very different example, uh, a very different uh, conclusion than uh, when you look at all the studies available. Um, I think with this, Eric, I'm finished the example. Okay, thank you. Eric, you're talking without your microphone unmuted. Please unmute your microphone. Okay. So what we found is it's not just that individual panels of scientists at the European Food Safety Authority are adopting overly narrow versions of approaches to what the risks might be, that narrow approach has been formally endorsed by an overarching um, part of the European Food Safety Authority. Uh, and this, it, 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 here we have the, the, uh, a report from EFSO in 2013, looking at how to assess risk to humans from combined exposure to multiple chemicals. And here is a quotation from it um, that it, it, it recommends the adoption of dose addition approach. It's the most common approach for the assessment of combined exposures to multiple chemicals and assume that all the components of the mixture behave as if they were simple dilution of other each other and have all have a similar MOA, which means mode of action, which is just like saying in mixtures you should assume that individual chemicals never interact with each other to create joint um, adverse effects. They all work entirely independently of each other. And, and that is a that is both bad science but bad policy um and yes they they, they they talk about relative potency factors this is an approach which uses data for, for, an, for an index chemical a particular one in the group and normalizes the potency of all others to assi assuming a similarity of mode of action between the chemicals in the mixture. But that is clearly a reductionist uh, assumption, uh, assumption and is the antithesis of precaution. So let's assume they all work in exactly the same way and they, they don't interact in ways that means their joint effect is greater than the sum of the individual effects. Um, oh yes, this is back to Angeliki for this slide. Yes, thank you, Eric. Uh, yes, it's just to give, a, to illustrate uh, another example how this takes uh, place in practice. And for the first time, um, after 10 years that the law had requested that uh, pesticides uh, should be looked at in combination because we're not exposed just to one pesticide, but we're exposed to mixtures of pesticides. And 10 years later, the um, 
uh, more than 10 years actually, in fact. The, the EFSA comes out with uh, two pilot studies and here I'm going to use one. Uh, this uh, pilot study the, looking at the combined effect of, um, of pesticides of, um, through food, via food, um, on chronic effects on thyroid. Uh, thyroid has a, a vital role in the development, uh, especially particularly, uh, so it has a very um, uh, vital role in early lifetime. So, um, so here I just want to uh, explain how based on the use of this assumption, so first of all we started uh, the looking only the additive, that's why it's called the cumulative, they, they don't look at synergy, so um, one chemical and two chemical like increasing their toxicity together. Um, so, so what we, when we examine this really long and technical uh, documents, uh, we found it's a probabilistic model. Uh, it's based on too many assumptions. Now, the studies that they used are old studies. So these are not uh, designed to look at the chronic effects on thyroid. So all the new studies, they were actually excluded. And this, um, so in these studies uh, were used to say, to set uh, what would be the the safe or the toxic threshold, let's say, depends how you see it. Um, therefore, it's, uh, they were quite important. And then even by using these studies, they did find, identify quite uh, a few risks, um, um, uh, particularly to younger and the, like the earlier, uh, earlier uh, stages of lifetime. So um, what they did, they did an uncertainty analysis and they corrected all these risks uh, they identified. In this uncertainty analysis, of course, uh, they, we see that they didn't take in, uh, into account that we're not exposed just to the active substance, but we're exposed to the whole mixture. They also didn't take into account that we're exposed to many other chemicals, not just pesticides and, and so on. Uh, so what's uh, dangerous from our side is that the conclusion in this case, it, it was, as it says here, that the consumer risk from dietary cumulative, uh, cumulative exposure is below the threshold that triggers regulatory action for all the population groups covered. That means that no action is needed. So the, the single pesticide assessment that they do is protective enough to cover exposure to all pesticides. So um, this is like an example how um, the conclusion can be under, it can undermine the risk um, and, and also how, yes, like, uh, so it can be quite uh, maybe even dangerous. And, and of course, this has not been, um, there's no real life experiment. They, they haven't done any, they, they haven't gone backwards to check if this assumption uh, is, is true. Okay. Hey, thank you, Angeliki. Yes, they are underestimating the risks. Um, <laughs> okay, well, that, that repeats it. Yes, if you want to know more about the ways in which um, chemicals can interact in and in, in which is which there's this very interesting report that came out last October and so you've got the, the reference there and you look at it um I was struck uh, recently I was walking down the road uh, actually just past the, the nearest petrol station to where I live here in Brighton in England and was struck by the fact that SO was selling its fuel boasting about synergy you know um so when it comes to trying to sell their fuel they boast that the ingredients together act more effectively than the individual ingredients on their own but when it comes to risks they insist uh, that there's no synergy whatsoever and here's uh, <laughs> um <laughs> More recently, yes, no, back in 2018, um, a group of very senior European Commission advisors, the of the so-called scientific advice mechanism, uh, 
uh, says a PPP you know, stands for plant protection products. Plant protection products approval and authorization process must better assess risk associated with mixtures and long-term exposure. And because they recognize that EFSA is not doing it. And so EFSA is both doing poor science and failing to comply with the legislation. Oh, here's another example from food additives about the narrowness and uh, denying that there can be interactive effects. Um, I, I was at a conference some years ago when a senior representative of the artificial sweetener industry at the time he was working for the German chemical company Hearst that was um, marketing and promoting its artificial sweetener called Asasulf NK. And he argued that yes, if you mix aspartame and Asasulf NK together, they do have a synergistic interaction in respect of flavor. Together they can produce a stronger taste than some of their sweetness, but he then insisted it's absolutely certain that toxicologically their effects cannot be mutually reinforcing. And then he published that in the book of the conference and the remarkably named Gerd Wolfart von Raimond Lipinski said, the quantities of different speakers as in, as of sweeteners as ingested by consumers, no combination effects must be anticipated, even under fed, you know, unfavorable circumstances, doses will be below toxic thresholds for toxicological effect and interactions of sweeteners must not be anticipated. Well, I think we can think grant the fact that his English choice of vocabulary might be marginally imperfect and what he probably meant was they need not to be anticipated <laughs> but actually he was also trying to convey the impression that there is some imperative you not only you need not look for them but you mustn't look for them you have to assume that there cannot be combination effects and I think that is an assumption which the European food safety is adopting and it's overly narrow it's not in accordance with the requirements of the legislation and it's letting down the protection of, of consumer and public health <laughs> oh yes and uh, yeah just another example I, in the 90s, I was inter interviewing a senior UK government official about additive testing and safety and say, well, why don't you require testing of mixtures? And his reply was very revealing. He said, but if we found an effect of a mixture, we'd have to then test all the individual compounds separately to see which individual compound had been responsible. He just couldn't get his head around the notion that toxicological effects could arise as a consequence of the interaction between components. Um, and that attitude persists and pervades official um, institutional science. Um, you know, they're, they're choosing to keep it simple. And Esther's risk assessments of pesticides, additives, and genetically modified organisms are profoundly incomplete. They're not looking at all risks. They're not looking at many risks. They're looking at a few risks and consequently only looking at small amounts of data. And they are they're adopting these implicit value-laden assumptions, we call them reductionist assumptions, um, which narrows the assessment, gives overly favorable assessments that favor industry rather than consumer protection, and they're doing it in spite of the legislation. So what we're arguing is that the European food safety is covertly making political judgments and hybrid scientific and political judgments, which they misrepresent as if they're purely scientific and that practice is contrary to Europe, EU's democratic, legal and constitutional requirements of its scientific advisors. And that needs to change. And I'll stop there. Thank you. And I would have gone on much too long, but I'll happily respond to the questions and answers and comments. Great. Eric and Angeliki, that was a great talk to start this series, setting out the problem, explaining the problem really, um, why the practice is so different from the theory.
Um, let's take a look at the question, the Q&A box, because uh, let me check again. I think nobody has raised their hand yet. But there are. Uh, yes, there are two questions from Sibuna Yes, um, we're not going to say the names of the okay. people who mm -hmm. asked written questions. Um, but the first question indeed is, re the scientific legislation, what role do hypothetical analyses or interpretation play? Or is it all about statistics, which some call as unreliable, lying with statistics? Um, hypo hypotheses, hypothetical analyses play a often an important role. Um, I've looked at in enormous detail at Essa's assessment of the potential risk from the artificial sweetener aspartame, and there there were examples where studies showed strong statistically significant evidence of adverse effects and in response the panel merely invoked a hypothesis that maybe the adverse effect was caused by something else as if that mere possibility was sufficient to dismiss evidence of possible risks and what struck me is that uh, hypotheses of that sort were never invoked when they were considering evidence from studies that didn't suggest risk. They didn't say, well, maybe it wasn't a sensitive enough test, or maybe they didn't gather enough data, or maybe they didn't report all the data they gathered. So uh, I, I think um, hypotheses do play an important role. And in relation to the, the second question, it, it, if I may continue, Diederich, um, refers to the glyphosate debate and who evaluated the claim that the results were statistically not sufficient. Um, in the first place, that judgment, uh, well, in the first place, that, that judgment was certainly, I don't know, made or at least endorsed by the European Food Safety Authority. It was rather tricky because the European Food Safety Authority was working from a draft report or from a report that had come to them from the German risk assessment organization, the Bundesinsufferistikobewertung, um, or BFR. But the BFR's document was a kind of copy and paste exercise drawn from a report provided by an organization called the Glyphosate Industry Task Force. Um, so that was the, the glyphosate industry's own portrayal of the evidence that it chose to look at, and it deemed it not statistically sufficient. And that judgment was rubber stamped by the BFR and by EFSA. Um, but has subsequently been challenged by independent scientists and statisticians. Right, we have um, a participant wanting to ask a spoken question. Alice Livingston, please mention your affiliation and now we have to see, yes, can you speak? Hi, yes. Can we see you? I don't know. Um, maybe. Yes, anyway, I'm from the University of Sussex. Oh, hi. hi. <laughs> yes, I wanted to ask about, I don't think you can see me, but um, I wanted to ask about the uh, chronic effects study and if there were uh, any endocrinologies was, in, was involved in the study and uh, if the reductionist approach to pesticide and uh, the evaluation of risk assessment of other, su of other substances is also uh, relating to which type, which branch of uh, science should be involved in the in the assessment, if it's uh, only purely toxicologist involved. Hi. Um, do, do you want me to take this, or, or Angeliki? You, you might want to come in. Yes, I, I, if I understand your question, there were two questions there. When they were first one was about um, was it about endocrine? endocrinological effects um, 
which is the topic on which many toxicologists have precious little expertise. Um, yes, I, I, I think it is the case that too narrow a range of possible adverse effects are deemed within the scope of these risk assessments. And so too narrow a range of evidence is incorporated into the assessment and too narrow a range of relevant disciplines are represented in uh, uh, the panels that do those assessments. Um, <laughs> I, I think your question was predominantly about glyphosate and perhaps then Angeliki would, would like to respond in, in relation to that. Um, but let me give an, another example that's similar to that on, on food additives. When EFSA asked its panel to assess the risks of emulsifiers, the only people they ask are toxicologists. And while it's important to ask whether there might be adverse toxicological effects of the use of emulsifiers, those aren't the, the only possible risks. So, for example, um, the main diet-related um, health problems in Europe nowadays, I think, are is obesity. And one of the reasons why obesity is a problem is because the oil and fat and calorific content of processed foods has risen a lot over the last 30 years and one of the reasons for that is because uh, the food industry has been making increasing use of emulsifiers incorporating up high levels of oils and fats um, in their product in the product and that's just nowhere on the agenda of the risk assessors of food additives, it's narrowly toxicological. So there are numerous respects in which too few, too narrow a range of different types of risks get assessed and own an overly narrow range of disciplines are represented on the assessment boards. Do you want to add something, Angeliki? <laughs> Uh, yes, I was going to add that the, it's true that, uh, th first of all, the experts that they are involved in the assessment, uh, many times they don't, they're not experts in endocrinology specifically. Um, and and the, the other thing is that they, even the studies are not produced because lots of times what they're trying to do is they want to, they're trying to get information on endocrine disruption from uh, other studies so they don't repeat uh, the animal experiments and of course these other studies are uh, they have their limitations so it's true that they we, we don't have the correct data to properly assess uh, and endocrine disruption and another example it, another case is also the studies are not properly reported by the applicant so what the applicant does um, the sometimes what we see is that they they haven't we're looking at the raw data we see that a lot of uh, of the data are not reported a lot of the first effects and when these dossiers they have uh, sometimes more than thousand uh, studies inside so it's really difficult to go one by one and examine whether what's the raw data and if it's written correctly and i doubt that neither member states or efsa uh, do that and we had one example on neurotoxicity recently with clopyrifos, where there was a publication by Grandjean, and they, they looked into the raw data and they found out that <clears throat> there were evidence of neurotoxicity in the studies that they were produced by the industry, but they not reported. And this played a key role in the EFSA assessment to, um, to find this substance as neurotoxic. Okay, thank you, both of you. We now have two more people wanting to speak and two more written questions. We shall go from one to the other, but let's take um, an oral question for first, a spoken question. Paddy von Zwanenberg, please speak up. Unmute your microphone. Okay. No, I, I, I think that's a mistake. My little daughter put the press the hand up button, so I don't actually want to ask a question right now. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe your daughter does. 
No problem at all. Let's take the next one then. Fernando Bejarano, please unmute your microphone and ask your question or put in your comment. Yes, uh, thank you for, for this um, excellent presentation. I am from Mexico, from the Pace Action Network in Mexico and the IPENHOP for Latin America. I think uh, this critique has been uh, is is very relevant because in the in the in south countries the model of risk assessment is present as the model to follow, and actually now when Mexico government is denying the glyphosate imports, invoking precautionary principles, this, there is all the pressure from industry, and embassies say, "Where's your risk assessment? This is a not a science based uh, policy decision." So, but my question is. What can the citizens of Europe can do on, on, in confronting this manipulation of the risk assessment? And uh, if there is some uh, parliament initiative or any other initiative to change this uh, manipulation of the risk assessment or the, um, to provide the priority of alternative assessment as a methodology to apply precautionary principle instead of risk assessment. Thank you. Perhaps I um, am I muted? No. Perhaps I could go first. Thank you very much for that question, Fernando. Um, I, I can see that uh, the Mexican government is in a difficult situation and doubtless is subject to quite considerable pressure from the country immediately to the north of Mexico, uh, both from the government and industry. Um, and your question about what, what can be done and, and, and to what extent can Europe can contribute uh, to changing its practices and what's going on. Um, certainly uh, organizations such as the Pestside Action Network, uh, which Angeliki, Angeliki so ably represents, is doing um, its best to inform um, governments and policy makers around Europe and the European Commission and in the European Parliament about these problems and the European Parliament is trying to do something about it. Um, one of the ways in which it's trying to make progress has been by introducing legislation which compels the European Food Safety Authority to act in a significantly more transparent way than it had done previously. Um, so it used to routinely accept unpublished evidence from industry and keep that evidence confidential and not put it in the public domain. The legislation from the European Parliament says that that practice must cease and formally the um, legislation, the implementation of that legislation um, must um, be complied with um, by spring of next year. So it's not fully in place yet. But from that point onwards, the um, European Food Safety Authority is supposed only to look at, uh, to accept evidence, uh, scientific evidence that it can put in the public domain. Uh, and it's also supposed to be more transparent than it has been over the in manner in which risk assessments are conducted. I think those are steps forward, but I don't think they go far enough. Um, it remains the case in Europe, as indeed it does at the World Health Organization and other places, that they continue to accept as members of their scientific expert advisory panels, people who are acting as paid consultants to the companies whose products they're evaluating. And I think that is wholly unacceptable. Uh, so they, EFSA, uh, they, they have, a, 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 what, what's their phrase they say? Oh, having an interest doesn't always mean having a conflict of interest. I mean, that's ho wholly naive. Um, I, I've seen plenty of evidence that people who act as paid consultants to chemical companies 
often adopt judgments that favor those chemical companies in ways that those scientists are themselves fail to be self-conscious about. They don't even realize where their prejudices lie, even as they articulate them. So I think there is some progress being made in Europe, but considerably more will be needed. Thank you. Angelique, do you have anything to add? Well, I was uh, I was going to add that we need also the scientific uh, the support from the scientists, <laughs> uh, but uh, we need the scientific opinion. We need scientific studies. For example, the reason we know that glyphosate uh, is um, carcinogenic to humans is because of scientific studies, um, and this has some somehow to we have to bring it forward. Um, yeah, the, the and there is. Uh, I think the parliament, there is some interest now. Of course, it's a little bit polarized, like everything these days, but it, there is interest. And so, yeah, and I think we need, I mean, what we're trying to do is to bring this scientific evidence to the policy makers, but also to inform the public. And this is what we can all do. Okay, thank you very much. Now there is a written question which you may not see, Eric and Angeliki. It's not in the open list anymore, but it's in the answered list because the uh, asker first didn't give his name and affiliation, but he has now. We're not going to say it as we promised, but we know it. And the question was, I know some very good scientists working in EFSA panels. How come that they accept this unscientific reductionist approach and keep doing this service? Eric, okay. Yes, we're not saying that every scientist on every panel is knowingly and deliberately understating and under investigating risks. There are, um, there are indeed good um, scientists, but what is needed at EFSA is not just people who are good at science, but people who are good at recognizing the where science and policy interact. And that is something that most scientists are not very good at. What would make a huge difference in this regard would be if the European Commission were to comply with the obligations that it nominally adopted uh, uh, under the codex uh, 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 text that I, uh, that I cited in my presentation. The European Commission and the Council of Ministers are systematically failing to do what they said they would do. They are failing to provide risk assessors with explicit risk assessment policy guidance in advance of risk assessment. And, and therefore, it's left to the scientists, as it were, to decide for themselves. And even good scientists can be unaware of their own um, normative values. L let me give you an example. I was at an I was an observer at a scientific panel, and it was on that occasion looking at possible risks from a pesticide product. And there was some evidence from a scientific study which suggested there might be um, um, an adverse carcinogenic effect from that that pesticide product. And a member of the expert committee, who incidentally had at the start of the meeting declared an interest in the Pesside company, that person said to the other members of the panel, we collectively as, as expert advisory scientists have a special responsibility to afford, to avoid a false positive, which meant we have to think of any reason we can as to why the evidence of possible risk and harm should be discounted. Now, 
all the other members of the committee sort of nodded as if, yes, well, that was the right scientific thing to do. But that struck me as exactly the wrong scientific thing to do. Because there was a value saying we should put the interests of the chemical industry ahead of those of consumers. No, that it should be the other way round. Members of expert advisory committees whose job is to help protect public health have a primary responsibility to look for false negatives. Studies that failed to find evidence of risk to see whether or not those studies were even had the power or the capability of detecting risk. So you can be a very good scientist and still not appreciate how values influence your judgments and the judgments of panels and committees in which you are participating. If I may ask something extra, Eric, yeah. forgive me, sure. but one of, your, one of your slides did say the reductionist approach has not just been adopted by EFSA panels, it has also been endorsed by EFSA. Panels are obliged to use it, you wrote. So uh, can a good willing scientist really get away That's from this and do what he really wants? <laughs> That's a good question, Didier. However, my answer is this. EFSA has issued its scientific panels with lots of guidance and if you take all the guidance as a totality, not all parts are consistent with all other parts. There is, I could also find other guidance in uh, to EFSA scientific panels which said they must systematically look at all the evidence and identify all um, uh, all uncertainties and all assumptions, <laughs> but they're not doing those things. So unfortunately the guidance documents aren't really being internalized by the expert advisory committees and they're functioning more as a kind of public relations exercise to convey to the general public um, that ESSA is doing a splendid job but <laughs> to misquote Shakespeare's Hamlet, this guidance is often um, no, no, sorry, no, yes, more observed in the breach than in the in, in, enforcement. Right. Okay. So we we can actually appeal to the uh, panel scientists of EFSA to to their consciences if we'd like to, like this question asker who knows some good scientists. He says. Um, well, I think, no, but I think organizations like ours need to be policing their conscience. We can't just leave it to them privately and confidentially. No. That's why it has to be transparent and publicly accountable. Right. Yeah. Okay, let's look at the next written question, um, which goes, of what relevance is the precautionary principle vis-a-vis -vis the real political decision-making process, processes? I mean, in reality, not only by lip services, is there any room for improvement? Ryan might wish to say something about this, or I could. I was simply going to uh, refer to the fact that we will be dealing with this more thoroughly and directly in the final session. Okay. Uh, there is a big question and it's just been uh, really referred to in Eric's response to the previous question as to the extent to which risk assessment science is thought to be intrinsically precautionary. And it is thought to be intrinsically precautionary basically because standard norm in science is the principle that Eric enunciated and reported as it were a few minutes ago which is avoid false positives and that practice actually would indeed uh, you know en encourage the assumption that science is always precautionary uh, in fact there's no such logic at all scientific inference the scientific knowledge can be either precautionary or non-precautionary 
And there is no legitimacy in assuming, as the European Commission does, I don't know about EFSA, I've never been able to interrogate them directly on that point. Um, but there is an intrinsic assumption that the risk assessment of EFSA does not require the precautionary principle. It's deemed to be by the Commission a purely risk management principle and it isn't for scientific knowledge. We don't need to interrogate the scientific knowledge produced by bodies like EFSA with very, very important policy consequences. We don't need to interrogate it for its precautionary, or for its consistency with the precautionary principle, which is after all a constitutional and legal pillar of European policy generally. Right. Thank you, Brian. Let's look at the next written question then, which goes, if I am allowed another question, I would like to ask if we accept that uncertainty is chronic in scientific assessment, at which point of the risk regulation there could be space for a more inclusive consultation before any final policy decision? Okay, I'll, I'll respond to that if I may. I certainly think that um, inclusive deliberation is important at many stages in the policy making process. Certainly in respect of risk assessment policy making, which as I indicated should be a responsibility of risk managers and, and should be decided in advance of individual risk assessments. But the codex text, which I think is a very good text, says that um, those risk assessment policy um, judgments need to be decided by risk managers taking into account what risk assessors say because they might have something useful to say about it but also in collaboration with all other interested parties so at that upstream end there is a role for non-governmental organizations um, consumer groups, environmental groups, and indeed industry groups to have their, to contribute their views about what risk assessment policies ought to be adopted. But then the, the decision should be taken by risk managers who are subject to some form of democratic accountability, um, which may be sometimes true of government ministers but is really true of, mem of European commissioners. Um, there is something of a democratic deficit there. In relation to the risk assessment stage of scientific deliberation, well, the scientists are under instructions to be fully explicit about all relevant uncertainties. But sadly, that is another rule with which they're not properly complying. And in order that they do comply with it, I think the whole process needs to be much more open and much more subject to public scrutiny, because that would provide occasion for other people to say, hang on, you know, you fail to acknowledge these uncertainties. But also, once the um, expert advisors have given reached their, their scientific judgment which would include <laughs> estimates you know indication of th the scope and limits of knowledge uh, then again there's uh, at, the, at the risk management stage there's scope for public deliberation but actually I, I want to argue something more specific which is that an appropriate role which would be both scientifically and democratically legitimate for the scientific risk assessors would be not to give um, what what my friend and colleague and Andy Sterling calls um, monolithic prescriptive advice they shouldn't be saying do this or do that a particular thing they what they should be doing is saying what they know and don't know about the possible consequences of following or failing to follow a range of different policy options. And then there could, should be a debate about risk managers, which is publicly accountable and democratically accountable for what action should then be taken. I think that would contribute to achieving um, both 
scientific and democratic legitimacy. Great, thank you, Eric. Nobody's raising their hand currently. I hope we didn't scare them with a sharp <laughs> discussion. But there are some written questions left. The next one goes, in real life, our qualifications keep getting evaluated. See, for instance, tests every few years if we're still qualified to keep our driver's license. Is it even considered to evaluate the so-called experts? Or is that <laughs> taboo to begin with? Which of you would like to reply to that? That's an interesting idea, but one of the things about science, maybe professors quite generally, but certainly about scientific professors, is that they take the view that they and only their, their colleagues are qualified to judge them because only scientists know enough about science to judge the quality of somebody's science. And so um, I, I like the idea of as it were, uh, regular credentials checks. Um, but if there are to be such reviews, it would be really important not to confine the contributors just to fellow professionals. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that finishes all our questions. I don't see any more questions. Um, just uh, a remark um, from someone saying, I would love to receive the recording and the PowerPoint presentation to yep. share in our list in Mexico and Latin America. Um, is that possible, uh, Eric? Um, would you make your slides available? Yes, indeed, I would be happy to do so. Okay. I can hardly call for transparency and then refuse to be transparent myself. Very good. Okay, we shall see how we can realize this. Um, I have to talk to Lucas about this, how we can send the PowerPoint presentation uh, and the link to the recording to all the participants, but I'm sure we'll manage to I do that. I think the way to do it is to, I'll save it as a PDF file and then let you have it. And that Lovely. will be a form in which I'd be happy for it to be shared. Lovely, thank you very much. Yes, another participant uh, has exactly the same request. And congratulates you and us and sir for organizing this and the speakers in particular for their eye-opening contributions. Um, we've passed the end time of half past five, um, so that only leaves it to me to thank you all the participants for listening and joining and being there and joining in the discussion. And I hope we'll see you again next time, next Thursday, at the same time at four o'clock in the afternoon Central European time when Dr. Angelika Hilbeck will be speaking about the GMO regulations and their interpretation, how current risk assessments of GMOs are bound to fail. Another example of the same phenomenon. Bye for now, hope to see you all next week. Yeah.